All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. In this recording, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. And just recall where we're at in the story of Matthew. Matthew's been putting together a handful of little episodes or snapshots from the life of Jesus that intend to show different kinds of people's responses to Jesus and his ministry of ushering in the kingdom of God. So here in this section, we have two snapshots that are connected, that are related together, and both of them revolve around the idea of not getting it, just failure to see, failure to understand, failure to believe. It begins with a short little snapshot about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So let's pick up in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1. It says this, The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and putting Jesus to the test, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And so just keep in mind who the Pharisees and Sadducees are. Uh, if you haven't listened to the background to the Gospels, they will give you a whole little introduction to these uh, two different groups of people in detail. But the Pharisees are like the popular level religious leaders of the day. Uh, they are the ones that believe more in the resurrection. They are the ones that lead the synagogue and all of that. The Sadducees are uh, aristocratic priests, and they tend to be located more in Jerusalem and run the temple. And so these Pharisees and Sadducees have aligned themselves together, even though they're theologically very different, even though they have very different understandings of how they should relate to Rome. They've aligned themselves together because they have a common enemy in Jesus, and they come to Jesus, it says, to put him to the test. So their intent, their motivation is uh, not honest, it's less than noble, and they want to put Jesus to the test, and they do so by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, the irony of this, we've seen this sort of thing before, the irony of this is that Jesus has been doing all sorts of signs, various miracles, various healings, casting out demons, all sorts of signs, and yet it's not enough. And so they want another sign. And Jesus responds to him this way in verse 2. But he replied to them, When it's evening, you say, It'll be fair weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, there'll be a storm today because the sky is red and threatening. And the reality is, is they're a farming society. They're a fishing society up around Galilee. So paying attention to the weather patterns, well, that's terribly important, knowing what the weather is going to be like today. And so they, they've got their signs in the sky to help them discern what's the weather going to be like in the next few hours. It's very common. In fact, even in, in American society, there's sayings very similar to these two here, right? Uh, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. It's the same sort of idea where you're reading what you see in the sky and saying, okay, the weather looks like it's probably going to get bad. They've got the weather patterns dialed in. They can read those signs of the weather just fine. So Jesus says to them, you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you are unable to discern the signs of the time? Like, signs uh, of God's kingdom breaking into their world are happening left and right, all around them, in and through the ministry of Jesus. He's even commissioning some of his apostles to go and extend his ministry. And so, signs that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is breaking into their present reality, their present world, they're happening left and right all around them. And yet, they want more? It's not enough? They can't discern? They can't figure out what's going on? That's the, that's the force of Jesus' question here at the end of verse 3. And then Jesus says this, An evil and adulterous generation wants a sign. And so, a sign will not be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them, and he went away. Now here, in this little snapshot, there's no explanation of the sign of Jonah. So either Jesus didn't include one here, or Matthew didn't feel the need to include it in his retelling of this story because he'd already explained the sign of Jonah earlier. In fact, he did so in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Here's what it says there. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. It's similar to what we're seeing here in Matthew 16. 
But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves a sign. And so Jesus has said this sort of thing before, maybe to a different group of Pharisees, maybe to, right, maybe there's some overlap, but he said this same sort of thing before. And then he says, so no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then we get the explanation of what the sign of Jonah is. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says, For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And so the sign of Jonah is connected to Jesus' death and following resurrection. And in the context of Matthew 12, because there's more detail there, the context is connected to judgment. In fact, Jesus says that this generation of people who have rejected him is going to be worse off than the people of the city of Nineveh from the Old Testament story of Nineveh and their wicked deeds. And so that's the idea of the sign of Jonah. And so Jesus says here in Matthew 16, 4, the same thing he said there in Matthew chapter 12, 38 through 40. No sign is going to be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And it's going to be a sign that will speak to their condemnation. They are going to be responsible for rejecting and killing the Messiah himself. And thus, it's appropriate that at the end of verse 4 here, Matthew notes that, and Jesus left them and went away. And there's sort of almost a a climactic note with that, right? That I'm kind of done with you. I'm done with your unbelief. I'm done with what you, uh, your rejection of me. In fact, Jesus will not interact with the Pharisees and Sadducees again until chapter 19 and then in Jerusalem leading up to his crucifixion. And so that and he left them and went away. Yes, it's in some sense just the end of this little episode. But I also think in the context, it's a little bit of a, a note of kind of, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. And uh, we'll have minimal interaction between now and then. And from there then, Matthew shifts to a scene involving the disciples and their own failure to understand Jesus and what's going on. And then Jesus connects their failure to understand with how small their faith is. Look what happens. Verse 5. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea. So we're in a whole new snapshot. At some point after that interaction with the Sadducees and Pharisees, they got into a boat. They sailed to the other side. But, verse 5, they had forgotten to bring any bread. So they sailed to a different district somewhere around the Sea of Galilee, and as they packed up their provisions for the day or however long they were planning to be gone, they had actually forgotten to get any fresh bread for the day. Well, that's the setup for what's about to happen. So look at verse 6. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, he's just interacted with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and that's the reason these two stories are connected. And so he says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What's he talking about? Well, leaven literally refers to bread starter, like sourdough starter. It was a little chunk of fermented bread that would be used to act like yeast in a new batch of bread. But that idea of leaven is frequently used metaphorically in Scripture for the idea of influence. In fact, in the Passover celebration, they're supposed to eat unleavened bread, and that was supposed to be instructive to them of removing influences that keep them away from God. Well, the disciples here, when Jesus says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they don't get it. They actually seem to just overthink it. And so look at verse 7. They began to discuss this among themselves. He said that because we didn't bring any bread. And so they're thinking, well, maybe leaven and bread. And they're trying to figure out what Jesus is getting at. And maybe because we didn't bring any bread, he's mentioning leaven. What in the world is he talking about? And remember, the Pharisees, at least, were very popular. They were the popular religious people. They led the synagogues. They were the people who sought to be most righteous. They knew the scriptures as well or better than anyone else. And so to always think negative about them. I mean, this is challenging. And so they're like, well, I'm, we're trying to figure out why did he say this? But verse eight, Jesus, aware of this said, you men of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you don't have any bread? So he knows what's going on. Maybe he overhears it and he chides them with this little nickname that he uses for them a handful of times in the gospel of Matthew. Oh, you little faiths. Oh, you men of little faith, right? Like you've got faith, but man, it's small and it's struggling to get it and it's struggling to understand. Why are you talking literally about bread? And then he reminds them of the two 
feeding uh, narratives that we've seen in the Gospel of Matthew, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 that we just saw in chapter 15. Look what he says in verse 9. Do you not yet understand? Like, why are you not getting this? Don't you understand nor remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you picked up? Don't you remember that episode maybe four or five months ago? Don't you remember that? How many baskets did you pick up? They picked up 12. And then he asks about the 4,000 in verse 10. Or what about the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you picked up? And they picked up seven, right? Don't you remember these things? And then he makes the point in verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you about bread? Like, if we needed bread, we could have gotten bread. There's various ways to get bread. Yes, we could have gone into the town and gotten bread. But don't you remember that I just kind of produced a lot of bread? So bread's not the issue. I'm not worried about bread. And then he restates, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so now that he's clarified for them, we're not talking literal, we're talking metaphorical. Now they get it. Look at verse 12. Then they understood that he didn't say beware of the leaven of bread, but beware of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so now they get the point. They realize, okay, we're talking metaphorically. We're talking about leaven as influence, not literal bread. Okay, now I'm with you. Watch out for the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch out for their influence. Watch out for the things they say. And so as we wrap up this short little uh, episode here, let me just offer a couple reflections. The first has to do with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, They come to Jesus, testing him, it says, asking for a sign. And yet, as we noted, as we went through the commentary, there had been signs done all around them. And this reminds us of something very, very important. Seeing does not necessarily equal believing. Sometimes, actually, believing enables seeing. In fact, if they had believed in Jesus, they would have seen all sorts of signs. But because they they don't want to believe in Jesus, they reject the signs. And that's very often the way it is. It doesn't matter how many signs, how much evidence, how much logic you might use. Uh, If someone doesn't want to believe, they refuse to believe, their heart is hard, they're not going to see. So seeing does not always equal believing. The first little reflection out of this story. The second one has to do with the second half, the little snapshot about the disciples. And that is this, that uh, growing faith happens through listening to Jesus. I think that might be part of the reason Matthew's included this little snapshot. It's a discipleship lesson for them and for us as he's put together his... Uh, his gospel, what we see here is that these guys believe, they definitely believe, but they're struggling to understand and they don't totally get Jesus. And Jesus chides them for their little faith. And then he instructs them. He teaches them and helps them to see, and then they get it. And there is sort of by that little description, something that's really important for us as disciples to learn as well, that the more we listen to Jesus the more we'll understand Jesus, and thus the more we will believe in and trust Jesus. That growing in faith happens through listening to Jesus. And so if we want to grow as disciples and strengthen our faith and have a greater grasp of what Jesus is all about, we need to make sure we just stick with it. We keep listening. We keep coming back. We keep asking questions of the text. We find people to help guide us through the text, and we keep listening and learning and making sure we're hearing Jesus well. I remember when I first became a follower of Jesus, I was in high school, and my mom, a few months after I started following Jesus, got me a a new Bible. She herself was a fairly new follower of Jesus, and so she bought me a new Bible, and I had this new Bible. I still have it, and it's got question marks in the margins where I didn't understand things. It has notes I wrote that I later realized were totally wrong, that I crossed out and wrote new notes over. And it was a matter of just reading and learning and questioning and making mistakes and figuring it out. And that's what we see with the disciples here with Jesus, is they're trying to figure it out. And you would hope by now maybe they would get it. Jesus even says, don't you understand? But they got to stick with it. And that's the way it's going to work for you and for me as well, that we're going to grow in our understanding of Jesus and our confidence and trust in Jesus as we stick with and listen to Jesus. And so growing in faith happens through listening to Jesus. All right, thanks for tuning in to this session of the Listener's Commentary on the New Testament. 
the listener's commentary is a listener-supported, crowdfunded Bible teaching ministry that is only made possible by the generous support of uh, tons and tons of people just like you. So whether you give $5 a month, whether you give $50 a month, whether you give $500 a month, thanks a ton for your support. Uh, The fruit that God is bearing all around the world is possible because of your generosity. And if in some way you have been blessed or impacted by the listener's commentary, could I just ask you this? Would you prayerfully consider joining the team of supporters so that this ministry could continue to grow and increase. Uh, We've got some things in the works. Uh, There's more administrative help needed. And so if you could step up and join the team of supporters, it would help this ministry continue to develop and grow. Uh, It would help this resource be discovered by more people. So would you prayerfully consider joining the team of supporters? You can do so by going to listenerscommentary.com, clicking the give button. It'll redirect you to a a page through World Family Mission, an umbrella organization, where you can put in a dollar amount and you can click a little box that says make this monthly, or you can leave it as a one-time donation and you can join the team of supporters right there. Thanks a ton in advance for your support. 